Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. Sorry, no guns today, we're doing bunkers instead. Right, I'm here in Switzerland on the edge of the village of Reutigen, which is just right there. And this point marks one of the entrances to what was known as the Réduit National, the uh, National Redoubt. Now, um, a little bit of background here. Switzerland was in a unique position during World War II, um, unlike in World War I, where it was completely surrounded by the Axis for most of the war. Certainly from um, 1942, late 1942 onwards, when Germany fully occupied all of France, who we basically entirely surrounded by Germany, occupied France and Italy, Germany's ally, later also occupied by Germany. Now, um, there's an awful lot of shoulda, woulda, coulda done by keyboard warriors 70 plus years after the fact as to what Switzerland could or should have done during the war. Let's look at it from their perspective. Switzerland at the time is a country of about 4 million people. By the time Germany had uh, done Anschluss, joined with Austria, and had uh, incorporated parts of Czechoslovakia and Poland into the Reich, we were talking about 80 million people who were considered Germans. That's a massive disparity in the number of people. Once you count occupied France and Italy in there, you're getting over 100 million people, and you've got this little island, little democratic island of 4 million people sitting in the middle, surrounded, that is trying not to starve, and is trying not to um, freeze to death. So, so, let's just leave the economics aside. Let's look at it from a military perspective. Now, it was fully understood by everybody that had the Germans invaded, Switzerland was toast. There's no question about this. This was understood on both sides by the Allies, by the other neutrals. Switzerland would have been toast. To put it in perspective, the active army, which is a militia army, um, was about 400,000 men at its peak, including all the auxiliaries and all the others. The number of people who could be put nominally under arms was about 800,000 people in a population of about 4 million. Now, just to put this in perspective, the number of German troops trapped in Norway alone at the end of the war, which was a, a, basically a backwater of the war, was 400,000. So we've got to get some perspective on this. Now, Switzerland's army was, as I said, a militia army. We'll get into this in much more detail later, probably in the, uh, in the context of the World War II project, the big collaborative one that uh, I'm participating in. Um, that's not for now, let's just do the basics. Um, an entirely defensive army, very little air power, ent almost entirely defensive air power at the start of the war, no bombers until later. And even then we're talking trivial numbers compared to what the, uh, what the Germans had. So the Swiss were in no position to do anything other than fight an entirely defensive war. So you've got to ask yourself, what is the path to victory? Whenever you're talking about any kind of military intervention, uh, whether it's forced on you or you enter into it by choice, like, say, the UK did uh, in 1939, what is the path to victory? The path to victory for the Swiss, the only one, was to not actually get invaded in the first place. Because as soon as they're invaded, they're toast, it's a matter of time, and it's a matter of how much damage they can do to their invaders um, to dissuade them. Um, once Switzerland was surrounded, the various earlier plans to have uh, a massive stop line on the Limmat up, uh, up near Zurich, that was just, pff, you forget about it. So basically, what their strategy revolved around for um, the vast majority of the Second World War and the entirety of the Cold War was um, hold the frontiers with bunkers and, and so on uh, with a relatively small number of troops, but hold on to them as, as long as possible without feeding more troops in. In the meantime, the rest of the militia are being mobilized. There's various stop lines at convenient points throughout the country on their way back here. And then the bulk of the army is in there, the Réduit. Think Rourke's Drift, the last final bit behind the mealy bags, but on a countrywide scale. Now, um, oh, I'm going to just end up going off on a horrible tangent now because uh, this is entirely fascinating. Basically, from mid war onwards, once the Reduit strategy became uh, a military reality, uh, the German invasion plans involved trying to, to, to invade very, very rapidly with a coup de main. Uh, 
to trap the Swiss Army, prevent it from ending up in the Réduit there. So, anyway, I think uh, that more or less gives the background. Most of the army's in there. This is the line to hold at all costs, and uh, we just want to avoid it. The idea is that, that the bulk of the army's in there, so if an invasion does come, you're going to be bloodied all the way down here with all the stop lines, all the bunkers, all the tank traps, etc., 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 and then the Swiss army can effectively keep up resistance militarily from here until they run out of ammo and or run out of food, and then, yeah. It was basically, it's a, we will just keep doing this and knowing the problems you have with partisans elsewhere, lightly armed, untrained, well, everyone's got a rifle here. We've in principle got 20% of the population under arms. Uh, we've got the thick end of a billion rounds of ammunition in there. And uh, come at me, bro. From the economic perspective, a bit more, what's also inside the redoubt uh, is the incredibly important rail tunnels, uh, which are the shortest route between Germany and Italy. And uh, for instance, the, there was a Gotthard contract, which meant that the Germans had right to non-military use to send trains through the Gotthard tunnel and the Simplon tunnels between Germany and Italy. Now, the Swiss couldn't abrogate this. There was no, there was no way. What they could do, though, was prohibit the Germans from sending military supplies through. And they were very, very, very strict on checking that the, uh, that the trains were not carrying soldiers, were not carrying arms. Um, the only soldiers that came through um, were certified wounded coming back up from Italy later in the war. Now, um, the big threat to the Germans, the big economic threat was, okay, you invade us, we've got this whole Ridgery stra strategy, and what we're also going to do is we're going to blow up the tunnels, which are the only things you actually want. Um, in the process of coming back, uh, of you uh, invading us, we're also going to blow up all the factories, which are the other things you want. So uh, basically, you've got to decide, do you really want to have about four million mouths to feed, lose hundreds of thousands of uh, troops in a, in a horrific conventional and then guerrilla war campaign and in the end ultimately the tunnels that you really want are blown up anyway. Um, the sort of last realistic invasion plan was drawn up in 1943 and uh, involved dropping paratroopers just over there and all sorts of places um, and that would have been carried out had it been carried out which I doubt but had it been carried out it would have been carried out in the autumn of uh, 1944 and D-Day all of that. Uh, put the kibosh on that thankfully. But anyway, that's a bit of the background. Now, behind the camera there, you've got Lake Thun. The Swiss were very good at using uh, the terrain as part of their defence, uh, unlike the Yugoslavs who uh, defended their border entirely, got smashed once, once, once the, uh, the border defences are through, they were more or less done. Um, what we've got over this side is the River Simmer, and then the, the River Kanda joins it, and then this was the big part of the defense. Right here it's a gorge, it's impassable to, to tanks. A bit further back it could be crossed. Uh, it goes right down to Einigen, there's the um, uh, the Kanderschlucht at Einigen, which is a big, big accidentally man-made uh, gorge. This is from the 18th century, but that's for another day, and the lake. Now, to get to where I'm standing now, you've got to have come up from Einigen, um, under the fire of three massive bunkers up there. I don't know if you can see them. I'll do a bit of B-roll so you can zoom in and see there's three massive bunkers there. Um, field guns, so seven and a half mil, seven and a half mil? Seven and a half centimetre field guns. Um, artillery observation posts, lots of machine guns, so you've got a field of fire of a couple of thousand uh, metres, basically as far as you, can, uh, as you can see here. You've got to come up through there. And then you are obliged to go around that corner there to enter the redoubt. That there is the uh, Sperstelle Satteleg, and we're going to take a closer look at that right now. Right, so uh, this is what is known in military terms as a passage obligé, and a, an obliged passage. There is no other way round. This hillside here is literally the edge, the corner of the Alps. From here, it goes up to the bunkers just up there, the big ones, and you've got the uh, the Stockhorn Kette, the Stockhorn chain, and this 
runs for miles this way, right down, uh, right down to the Fribourg Alpen. And basically, there's no way to go around this point here. The only other ways around are also in entrances to the Réduit, further back down there. So uh, that makes life a little harder if you want to move tanks, vehicles, large numbers of troops. So you are obliged to go around this corner here. And we're bracketed on this side by the uh, Simmer Gorge. And uh, that bridge wasn't there, that's modern. And just over there on the other side uh, is actually the federal powder mill making nitro powder. It's now Nitrochemie Vimis, owned by Rheinmetall of all people. So, right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk around this corner and see what awaits a potential invader and that jogger from just then. So, as we get a view around the corner, we come immediately under the fire of a fairly substantial bunker, which is there. Now it's extremely well camouflaged and uh, unfortunately it's been, after it's been de decommissioned, it's been, um, it's been blocked up. So it's possibly even better camouflaged than it was back in the day. But uh, as soon as you come around the corner, there's an infantry cannon, which is the Swiss term for an anti-tank gun, and a machine gun, so a Model 1911 Swiss Maxim that can give you the good news. But that's not all. So in addition to the bunker that's down the road there, we've got two militarily important objects right here behind me. Now, uh, we'll walk over to it and see the remains of it, but there's a, uh, a, a Straßensperre, so a tank trap. Uh, so sort of eye section beams stuck into holes uh, into a con in a concrete plinth in the ground. And then right there, the section of road right before that is rigged to explode. What's called a Sprengobjekt. That would uh, make life a little spicy. So let's go and have a closer look at what remains of both of them. So we're trying not to fall down into the, uh, into the river there. Uh, here we've got the remains of the plinth which was wider than the road, so that you couldn't drive your tanks around it. Um, and the base of this would have had lots and lots and lots of square holes in it with covers and then big sections of I-beam and uh, old railway line to uh, inconvenience tanks. Okay, let's try not to fall into the river here. Just to give you an idea of quite how steep this is, it really is very, very steep indeed. I desperately don't want to uh, slip down it under these conditions while holding a camera, but at least my demise will be filmed. Right. So we're down here on this section of, uh, section of road and uh, this is the first one. Now, when you see things like this, you don't realize that they're anything in particular, but uh, once you've seen them, you can't unsee them. This was a shaft filled with explosives, quite a lot of explosives. The idea being that before your, uh, your little tank could be inconvenienced by the roadblock a few meters that way, it's been inconvenienced by being blown in the air. And its little friends behind are also inconvenienced by the road not being there anymore. Basically, enough explosive in three shafts. Let's see if we can identify the others. Ah. There's number two. And then coming around here, we can see number three. So we've got three shafts in this section of road, which, just to give you some perspective, would have blown it down into the gorge behind me. And it really is very, very steep. Yeah. And wet and muddy and slippy. So I'm uh, now standing between the roadblock and the bunker. The roadblock's back there. You can, should be able to just see the plinth where it extends to the right of the road. Now, they couldn't leave the roadblocks in place all the time because people needed to use the road. There weren't as many roads as today. Uh, access wasn't as easy. This is one of the main routes into the Simmental over that way. So they had to have somewhere to put all the bits, nasty metal and stuff 
to, to, to stop the tanks. So they built a cavern there, which post Cold War decommissioning, it's been, it's been blocked over. So if you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't know it was there. But uh, there is a cavern behind there. It was filled with spiky metal things to put in the roadblock over that way. And just to give you an idea of the relationship between that and the bunker. So you've got the corner that you've got to come around and you come under fire from the bunker. You've got the plinth about there. So bring it round, we've got the cavern. And then all the way round, and you've got the bunker. Yep, there. Right, so I'm standing at the corner of the bunker, and what they've done is they've camouflaged it as part of a pre-existing wall. Uh, there was a wall prior to 1940 up there, a Stutzmauer, to hold the side of the hill up, and they sort of extended that and built a massive concrete bunker there, and it's extremely well camouflaged. Um, as I said, it's been sort of more camouflaged since it was decommissioned, but let's go and have a look at it. So looking back up the road to the, to the tank trap and the explodey section, um, we've got the, you can see where, where the entrance was on the side of the bunker. And as I said, they, they took the existing wall and, ex and extended it and, uh, and built up around it. Um, this, is, this is basically mesh covered in concrete and spack and post decommissioning they've uh, they've gone over the seams they've made it a lot a lot neater but you can still see the remains of hinges and so on so this is a modern soak away and then here is the business end So, so as for the business end, there's a massive hatch there that would have hinged open, controlled from the inside. And it's actually quite a massive bunker. It's, it's two levels, a machine gun on the bottom level, and then up the top, an infantry canona, so 4.7 centimeter anti-tank gun, and an observer's position. Uh, you can just about see the hinges. And as I said, they've post decommissioning, they've, they've, they've hidden them a lot more. Uh, there's a ventilation hole they've left in the top there. Unfortunately, we can't get in this one. It's been very, very, very well decommissioned. Uh, you'd have to break through the nice work they've done to get into it, but we can still have a nice idea about the scale of it and, uh, and what its field of fire was. So I'm going to walk down right up to it just to give you an idea of the scale. I'm a nice round 5 foot 11 tall, well it's around in metric, 180 centimetres, and uh, yeah, it's quite a massive bit of kit. And then here, this is roughly, I'm roughly at the height of the machine gun, possibly a bit lower, but uh, you can see that I've got a field of fire right round down to the corner. I can bring the, uh, the roadblock and the blown up section entirely under fire. Unfortunately, there's no really good vantage point on the bridge where you can see the whole setup because the way the trees have grown up but uh, we've got the uh, explodey section of road we've got the roadblock and then up there we've got the bunker so I'm standing on the home side of the uh, river simmer now and we've got the powder mill literally just over there Behind me there, we've got the exploding section of road and the uh, roadblock. And uh, you're probably all thinking, but Mike, it's only like one bunker. So all you'd have to do is uh, under cover of night and fog and smoke and what have you, infiltrate some infantry down into the gorge and up to the bunker with some satchel charges, blow it all up and then drive our panzers through and we'll be eating great big fat schnitzels in Uncle Tom's schnitzel barn before you know it. And you'd be right. Apart from the massive schnitzel thing, because rationing here was pretty harsh during the Second World War. Anyway, they thought of that. As a general principle, all of the Swiss defences are based with a what they call a Werk and a Gegenwerk. So uh, uh, a Werk would be a uh, ouvrage, a... Uh, what is that in English? It's a, uh, it's a construction, a military object, and a, and a counter object. Sometimes in the most simple ones, in a very, very confined space, the, uh, the uh, roadblock might be the Werk, and then the bunker covering it, the Gegenwerk. Uh, it, it, a Werk might be a bunker, the Gegenwerk might be another bunker. And in this case, you've actually got multiples. You've got several 
Werken. You've got the, uh, the exploding section of road and the roadblock. You've got the bunker. And there's actually, on the home side, there's a whole chain of bunkers. It's called uh, the, the Auwald setup that stretches all the way down this side of, uh, of the river, particularly covering the part of the river that is passable to tanks. So, uh, but only one of the bunkers in that section uh, interests us because it's the only one that's integrated into, into the satellite setup. And it's just down there. So let's go take a look and see what that does. So this here's the bunker Auwald 4, and if I'm going to say it locally, Auwald 4. And uh, it's actually at a funny angle, which I'll show you in a minute when I turn it around, because uh, it's intended to integrate with the subtle egg uh, setup and fire on the roadblock and the exploding section. And not only that, it can fire around the corner to a certain degree. Um, and it's got three openings. So one machine gun, one anti-tank gun, 4.7 centimeter, and one observer. It's all integrated by telephone and, and so on, but the observers were very important for direct fire weapons such as, um, such as the machine guns and the, and the, the infantry cannon. And this here, if we turn around, you can see the, you've got the bridge over there and you've got the, uh, the setup. So this bunker can quite happily pepper the, uh, the other side of the valley. So any, any infantry coming around there are gonna be in for a surprise. It's really difficult to see where the fields of fire are because of all the trees, but uh, it's just gonna focus on the trees. You can actually see around the corner. Now, if we walk around the side of the bunker to its entrance, you can see the good news hole which would have had a, uh, uh, probably a submachine gun poking through it to give people the good news. And that's basically the extent of the bunker. Finally found a bit of peace and quiet around behind the Avolt 4 bunker. Now, uh, one final thing to mention on these is uh, that bunkers aren't everything. I mean, they're, they're a major part of the defense, but on their own, you can almost always infiltrate small numbers of infantry up to a bunker who can then blow it up with prepared charges. Um, watch plenty of uh, D-Day footage of, of, of how that works. Now, what there also is as part of this integrated defense, and there's no trace of them left anymore because they're all filled in after the war, is external infantry positions. Because even if Alvalt Fear can pepper the other side of the valley with machine gun fire, if it's night and it's foggy and they can't see, all they can do is fire on fixed lines and, and hope if they suspect an attack is going in. If the attackers are being very, very quiet, they might not know. So what they had to have as well was dug in infantry positions all over the place to protect the bunkers and, to, and to, to cover gaps. So there were machine gun positions, infantry positions down in the valley, in the woods here. Uh, as part of the Auwald complex further back down that way, there's uh, what they call Infanterie Unterstände, which is sort of basic accommodation. It's sort of dug in accommodation bunkers. They're not fighting bunkers. There's plenty of little individual fighting bunkers. I think they're cold, mostly Cold War era though. Um, the point being that even the best protected bunker on its own is still vulnerable to people, small numbers of people getting up to it with explosives and blowing it up. So unfortunately no trace of that left, but that's how it works and that's how it's integrated and that's how they fill in the gaps left and um, that's how you do dissuasion. So thank you so much for surviving this far and watching me blather on about bunkers. Please like and subscribe to the video. Please consider supporting us on Patreon if you haven't already done so. All help is much gratefully, is very, very gratefully received. And uh, see you again sometime. Bye.